Slide number one uh, is basically the, the bioscience that blows my mind. So this is my magic wand on the left. Uh, I got this at Harry Potter World. And on the right is Hermione Granger. And I have been studying Hermione and how she uses her magic wand. I've read all of the books about her, but I just can't quite figure out how to make it work to do magic things in science policy. But what you're gonna hear from in terms of our first speaker, Jack and Draca, is how he has absorbed information that is freely available out there on the internet and other places uh, to really you know, try to put that together into one place. So Jack, you are a student inventor, a scientist, you're now a cancer researcher, you're the 2012 Intel Science Fair grand prize winner. Um, you, you have been to probably more places than uh, you know, many 16-year-olds around the world. <laughs> Talk to us a little bit about the work that you're doing. Let me show a couple of photos. So slide number 13, if you can put that up. That is a picture, I believe, when you were winning your, uh, <laughs> your award. And <laughs> you can see why I'm having Jack go first, because he's really going to set the tone for our other panelists. If you can put up slide number 14, these are you know, examples of other times that you're, you're winning awards. Um, how about slide number 18? So you recently had the opportunity to visit Washington, D.C. You live in Baltimore, which isn't that far, but uh, you got a chance to go to a pretty special place, which is uh, the Oval Office and Pennsylvania Avenue. Talk to us about this journey and, and how, how you got to where you're sitting right now. Yeah, so essentially what I created was a new way to detect pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancer that costs three cents and takes five minutes to run. And it's 100% accurate, but also it can detect the cancer in the earliest stage when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. Now you might be wondering why on earth is a 16-year-old really interested in pancreatic cancer? I mean, it's one of those obscure cancers. And I actually became interested because a close family friend passed from the disease when I was 13 years old. And then what I found is that 85% of all pancreatic cancers are diagnosed late, when someone has less than a 2% chance of survival. And we really have no current standard of, diagno uh, standard of diagnostics. Our current standard is an $800 per test technique that also misses 30% of all cancers and hasn't been updated in over six decades. So then I decided to go and strive towards revolutionizing pancreatic cancer diagnostics with my armory of knowledge from ninth grade biology. <laughs> and so I went to a 13-year-old's best friends for knowledge, Google and Wikipedia, how I get through every high school test. And essentially what happened is I looked up what, are, what these different proteins are found in your bloodstream when you have these different cancers. And I stumbled across this um, database of over 8,000 different proteins that are found in your bloodstream when you have pancreatic cancer. So I just started plugging and chugging through this, and on the 4,000th try, I finally found a protein called mesothelin that just might work. And mesothelin is just your ordinary round-the-mill type protein, unless you have pancreatic, ovarian, and lung cancer, in which case it's found at these very high levels in your bloodstream. But also, the key is that it's found in the earliest stage, when someone has close to 100% chance of survival. So then I had found a really reliable biomarker for pancreatic cancer, I shifted my focus to actually detecting that. And my breakthrough came in the most unlikely of places, high school biology class, in my opinion, the absolute stifler of innovation. <laughs> And I had snuck in this article on what are called single-walled carbon nanotubes. And that sounds like a big, complicated name, but they're really simple. They're just these long, thin pipes of carbon that are an atom thick and 150,000 dead diameter of your hair. Yet, despite their small size, they have these incredible properties. They're kind of like the superheroes of material science. And we're learning about antibodies, essentially molecules that only react with one protein, in this case, a cancer biomarker. And what I thought is, if I weave these uh, antibodies into this network of carbon nanotubes, then you would have a network that would only react with one protein. But also, due to the properties of carbon nanotubes, you would have a network that would only change its properties, when, uh, its electrical properties, in the presence of that protein, and thus detect pancreatic cancer. And it's actually very simple to produce. It's kind of like making chocolate chip cookies, which I love. <laughs> you start with some water. You pour in the carbon nanotubes, pour in the antibodies, mix it up, take some paper, dip it, dry it, and then you can detect cancer. However, 
I all of a sudden realized I needed a lab. My mom had put up with quite a lot. Like I got to culture E. coli on my like, kitchen countertop where I make sandwiches. She wasn't quite happy about that. But cancer research, that was pretty, that, was, that wasn't going to happen in my house. So what happened is I emailed 200 professors at Johns Hopkins University and the National Institutes of Health that had anything to do with pancreatic cancer. I emailed them a budget, a timeline, a procedure, and materials list. And I sat back waiting for positive emails to pour in. And then reality took hold. I got 199 rejections. Yeah. And some professors, I realized, weren't really as nice as their profile picture on the site looked like. <laughs> they kind of ripped apart my entire procedure line by line, saying why each and every step was wrong. However, one professor said maybe, and I went into his lab, and it turned out to be an interrogation. I sat down. And instantly he starts firing these questions at me, calling in more and more PhDs. And then there are like 20 PhDs plus me and the professor crammed into this tiny office room. But I got through it. I guessed on a lot of those questions. And I got them all right. I guessed C, like I do on the SATs. <laughs> and then what happened is I worked in the lab. And I realized my procedure was nearly as brilliant as I thought it had been. But some months later, I ended up with one small paper sensor that could detect pancreatic ovarian and lung cancer with 100% accuracy so far in clinical si uh, trials. I know 100% is kind of taboo in science at times. But um, it's actually 168 times faster, over 26,000 times less expensive, and over 400 times more sensitive than our current standard of diagnostics. But also by simply shifting out that antibody in the sensor, you can pretty much detect any disease, ranging from HIV, AIDS, to Alzheimer's, heart disease, even other forms of cancer. So that's my story. All right. <laughs> So Jack, had your, you, you talked about how your mom didn't want you to do cancer research in her kitchen, but they clearly played a significant role in fostering this you know, kind of innate curiosity that both you and your brother have, because your brother is a little bit older and he is equally uh, inquisitive about the world. You know, what, what, what was it like for you growing up with, with your folks? I mean, what were they doing? I'm sure many parents out there would like to know um, how they can foster this same you know, sort of passion and zeal that you have. Well, um, I actually became interested in science when I was three years old. It actually had a bit to do with my other hobby, kayaking. So my parents got me and my brother, we were three and five at the time, this big plastic model of a river. And we would just like chug a brick in there and then test out how the bar flow changed at the uh, fate of an unfortunate piece of styrofoam. And um, then what happened is I started getting more and more into science. and. My parents, I thought they were jerks when I was younger. Like, they wouldn't answer any of my questions, but they would always ask me questions. I was like, why were you asking me these questions? But it worked, I suppose. And eventually, I, they kind of just like introduced little things. And believe me, we went through like all the musical instruments, all the sports, everything. I learned how to play the trombone quite atrociously. And then I finally landed on science. and. Then in sixth grade, I did my first science fair project, and I loved it. So 